I'd like to, to read from you, uh, from the scriptures for you this evening. And it's um, Exodus 25, verse 31, through to the end of that chapter. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, and three branches out of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and flower, on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand, and on the lampstand itself there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms, with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstand. Their calyxes and their branches shall be of one piece with it, the whole of it a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamps shall be set up so as to give light on the space in front of it. Its tongues and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with all these utensils out of a talent of pure gold. And see that you make them after the pattern for them, which has been shown you on the mountain. Moses had been given his... Uh, his instructions on the mountains. In another version that I read, it said that uh, they wrote that, uh, uh, that the Lord commanded Moses in this design. He couldn't he couldn't detract from it. It was as given to him on the mountain. I suppose we start with a question: uh, What was the purpose? What was the function of the lampstand? And what's the application for us today? I think upon those things as we go through this. But when you remember when Israel came out of Egypt, it was then that they became a nation. And it was there in the wilderness that uh, God gave the instructions for the tabernacle and how it was to be set up and what it was to be made from and all the coverings that went uh, for the tabernacle itself. And the tabernacle itself was to be a witness to the nations. It was to show the nations around that God was in the midst of his people. It was a witness to the fact that the Israelites, as they would be known, would be a light to the nations. And Isaiah records that for us too. But the menorah was and is, it was the symbol of the nation of Israel. And it was adopted apparently in February 49. It's not on the flag of Israel, that's the sign of King David, it's the uh, David's star, but the, 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 the symbol of the nation is the menorah. When you see the menorah, you know that it's the symbol of the Jewish peoples. But the menorah itself was in the core of the, of the tabernacle, it was in the holy place. It was in the tent, in the first half of that, that tent of meeting. It's, uh, it's light, from that menorah, it filled the whole of the, the holy place. And it, it never went out. The light from that menorah never went out. And the, the old sages of the past, uh, they emphasised that light was not a violent force. Light itself is not a violent force. And Israel is to, to accomplish its mission in, in this world by setting an example, not by using force. And the prophet Zechariah highlighted this when he had a vision of God. And he had a vision of the menorah and he recorded what God said. And he said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. That's Zechariah 4.1. So let's look a little more closely 
uh, this menorah, what, it, what it's really all about. As we read, the, the, the workmanship of the menorah was specific. Uh, there was a design and it was of hammered gold. It was handmade, not from, as we would do today, manufacture several parts and put it together. This was out of one talent of gold, one piece. How big it was, I don't know, but it must have been quite large to hold all those, can those lamps and to light the whole of this tent. Hammered from one piece of gold. Its shaft and its flowers and the branches all made according to a pattern. It wasn't left to Moses to design it. It wasn't left to Aaron to think about it and design it. It was a pattern given by God, commanded by God to follow that. And it followed the design of the, of the almond tree. So it was the symbol of Israel. But I believe for us today, it's also a symbol of revelation and truth. It brings the light of God shining in a dark place, a dark place of this world. But the purpose of that menorah was to give light in the holy place, to light up uh, that sacred place. It was a sanctuary. It was a place where only the Kohim could go. That's the priesthood. It's only they could go into that holy place. And of course it was the high priest only who go into the Holy of Holies once a year. But the Kohim, they had to serve in the holy place and they had to deal with the showbread and the altar of incense. It was an enclosed tent. There were no windows, no, no natural light in there. The entrance was drawn tight. Um, and so it was in total darkness in the Holy of Holies. There's no light except the light from the menorah itself, which was never to go out. It shone on the table of showbread. It could only shine forward, and so it would be at the side, or at the, I think it was on the, uh, on the right side, looking to the entrance, on the right side of the, of the tent. And it could only shine forward and give its light forward, so it shined on the showbread and the altar of incense. It just illuminated them. And it's in this holy place, there was the menorah, a sevenfold branch of lights fed by pure olive oil. And with that oil, the light was never to go out. They had to make the oil and make sure that it was available at all times, and that was the duty of the Kohenim, the priests. Because the holy place was the, that's the only place, the only, only the priests were allowed to go there. They were the intermediaries between God and the Israelite people. The priests were the intermediaries. Who are the modern day priests? Who are the modern day priests that officiate in this holy place? Well, I put it to you that we are, you and I. We are the priesthood of God. One or two places in the scripture says that we are the royal priesthood. We are kings and priests before God. So it's you and I that are the intermediaries between God and man. We carry his light. We are indwelt by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God. We carry that anointing. I think the fact that the Menorah was made of pure gold, it is also symbolic. It's symbolic of something very precious, something very rare. And the emphasis of pure gold, I think, stands for the purity of the light that it held. Because it was a special light, it was a pure light. It, wasn't, uh, it was made from uh, burning uh, olive oil and the olives which had been pounded to, to get the oil out of them, pure oil. Uh, there'd be no um, bits and pieces in that oil. It will be pure oil drained from the pounding of the, the oil. And that speaks a lot, doesn't it, about the pounding that Christ had on the cross. And of course, the oil being the, the sign or the symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit that's at work in us, but it's that oil that flowed through the menorah into each of those branches and down the branches into the into the lamps. I'm not sure where there was a like where they filled it, maybe they just filled the lamps individually. They filled all these separate lamps individually. But it was filled by this pure oil, representative for us of the Holy Spirit. It was symbolic of the light, that light from the menorah. It's symbolic of the light that was to go out to the, to the nations, to all those around. The, the nations around would see the tabernacle. They'd see the, uh, the smoke coming from the, um, uh, the, the altars there. And that was their testimony. That was the witness to the nations around. But that contained this light, the light from the menorah, which lit up this sanctuary, this holy place. And as the, the Kohanim, the priests, they served in that holy place, they went about it and they were bathed in that same light. They were in that holy place, that sanctuary, with the, the pure light from the menorah upon them. And as, just as the, the oil, the pure oil burned, it gave out a, a brilliance of light. I don't know whether we could achieve those things today. We've lost a lot of skills, I think, in life. But the Word tells us that the Word itself is a lamp to our feet. I believe that speaks, uh, the menorah speaks of the Word of God to us. It illuminates us. It's a lamp to our feet and to a light to our path. And who is this lamp? Who, does it, who is it representative of? I believe it's representative of Jesus himself. He is the one that gives the light to the world. So this, this menorah is important. It's not just a lamp in a dark place. It's not just something to light up a dark tent. It's very specific and it speaks to us today. It speaks into our generation, to you and I today, to 4,000, 5,000 years ago. So when we come into the presence of God, into our holy place, our sanctuary, it, the place where we go to be alone to be with God and to pray and to unburden ourselves, to worship and to look into the word of God itself, to find strength and comfort, it's there in that holy place, in our sanctuary. That's the place of revelation to our hearts. It's the revelation of truth to our world. It's the revelation of truth to, of God that, that he makes known to us as the priests of God. And we have to carry that. So the Holy Spirit, a representative of the oil that's burnt, reveals the truth of the word to you and to me. That revelation, which is the light of God's word, strikes our hearts. It makes clear things that um, well, the, take away the confusion of life. And there's an awful lot of confusion, I think, in today's Christian world. Uh, what, what, what we should accept and what we shouldn't. But the word of God is clear. The word of God doesn't change. It lays down it in truth. And it doesn't change, and we should adhere by it. The word of God is the light of God. Take, it'll, it'll, it'll clarify all the contradictions of this world that we are fed on the media. It, it, it'll take away all the contradictions of a world that wants to change definitions of truth, that says that we'll change things, not according to the word of God, but according to cultural change and changes of society. Those things will change, and they'll change with every denomination, every, <laughs> not denomination, <laughs> every generation. But the word of God is stable. It doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And if the word says, thou shalt not, that's what it means. We can't change that. Culture can't change that. So it speaks into a world that wants to change 
the pure oil of the spirit. It wants to change it to the oil dug from the ground out of man's fallen culture and fallen nature. But the word of God is true. The menorah is made of, uh, of one piece of pure gold. It stands for oneness and the purity of the whole candelabra and of the light that it produces. One piece, one talent. But the light, what, what is the light? Well, we've looked at it a little. I believe it's the word of God. It's the Bible that we have in our hands that lights us up each day. But light, this light was produced by bringing fire to the pure olive oil. Oil which was itself was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Fire burns the oil. And burning is a refining process. It gets rid of all the things that are, shouldn't be there. It burns them up and gets them out of the way. It rids uh, the, the oil of dross. And it reveals that which is pure. Burning produces light. And that's what we see in the menorah, in, the, in the, uh, the, the, the lamps on the branches. And so the whole purpose of the menorah, as you come into the holy place, is to show the light of God, to dispel the darkness of this world. And it was dark in a tent, in that tent. It wasn't like our modern tents that you see on the campsites uh, where you know the light streams through from the, the top if you wake in a lovely thing to wake up in the morning with the sun shining with a under canvas uh, and you see it shining through that's great but it wasn't like that in the in the in this tabernacle there were I think it was I can't remember it was three or five layers of uh, over the top of the tabernacle it was dark in there. I don't know whether you've ever been down a coal mine with the lights out. I've been down once. And it's so dark, the darkness is thick. Uh, you, you can't see your hand in front of your face. You can't even see any sort of outline. And I think it was probably a bit like that in, the, in, the, in this holy place. It was dark. And it's in there that the menorah brings the light of God. And it brings the light of God that it dispels the darkness, it gets it out. There's a brilliance in that place. And that's the same when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to us through the word of God. It dispels the darkness. It gets rid of the dross. It brings the truth and helps us to understand the purposes of God. Sadly, I think, there's many in the churches today that have lost that and the church has ceased to be a place of truth. Made of one piece of gold. Fire burns the oil and burning is refining, as I've said, it gets rid of the dross, the purpose. As as you come into the holy places to show that light of God, to dispel that darkness of this world. The menorah, had seven branches on which they were seven lights. The fire in the menorah was permanently lit, never to go out. It was fed by pounded olives and the producing that oil that came from it. And that was maintained by the priest. That was the Kohenim's job. That was their, part of their service. They, had, they were involved in creating that oil and making it pure. Their job to preserve the permanence of the light and it's the job of the priests to keep the light of God, the truth, shining. And you know, as I think about it, that's our job today. The pounding of the oil producing the light is what we should be doing. It, it's reading, it's going to the scriptures every day. They had a daily service to produce this oil. They were doing it all the time, every morning, producing oil. Each week. And that's what we should be doing. We are the royal priesthood. I think also the fire represents the divine light. It must be kept lit to spread light throughout the world, starting with God's people themselves, starting with you and I. Unless we hear the truth 
on pulpits like this throughout the land, people will never know. And so it behoves us to uh, present the gospel clearly and present the claims of God, not just the gospel. Once, once we know and understand Jesus and invite him into our lives, we have a walk with God. And it's in that walk that we must know the truth of God and not be drawn aside. Not be drawn aside by different philosophies from the church that don't emanate from the scriptures itself. It's important. We are to be a light to the Gentiles, as the tabernacle itself was in the days of Israel when they became that nation. We are the witness of God's presence to the nation. The church itself today, the church per se, all the denomination, should be the witness of God to the nations. The menorah was kept in the holy place, in the tent of meeting where God met with his people. And then later on, uh, when uh, they grew as a nation and things happened, history uh, teaches us that they, they uh, built a temple. Solomon uh, built the temple for David and the, and the menorah was kept in the temple and it was kept in that place. And God would come down and his presence would, would fill the temple. And there he would consecrate the, the menorah and all the utensils to be used in the, in the tabernacle itself. So there in that sacred place, he would meet with his people. And it's there in the holy place that God would make his glory known. But sadly, the, the temple was broken down. The second temple was uh, destroyed, wasn't it, for so long. But as we look on Jesus and dwell in the secret place, we behold the true light created, creating in our society the lifestyle of light. And I'm sure you know many people that once they've invited Jesus into their hearts and their lives, they're changed. They become, uh, their motivations change. They become new people. I know we can perhaps all look at people that we've known like that, even ourselves, have changed because of the influence of Jesus in our lives. So Jesus, when he comes in, he creates through us in our society the lifestyle of light, lifestyle of purity and truth. You see, God has the ability to cause and to create and to reveal spiritual light within each of us. And as we wait upon him, we will receive more of his spirit and more of that, that life. In Isaiah 11, uh, it talks about the sevenfold qualities of the spirit that will rest upon him. Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. There were seven lights on the menorah, and the pure oil flows into each of those seven flowers, giving light. And in Jesus, we see the seven qualities of the Holy Spirit's flow. The number seven is uh, the number of completion or perfection in the scriptures. It shows that Jesus is the perfection of God's creation, the perfection of his anointing. And the fullness of God was contained in Jesus. The fullness of God contained in Jesus. This Messiah, this Jesus expresses those sevenfold qualities. The spirit of wisdom, of understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. It's this Jesus and the fullness of oil that flows, the oil of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of God that flows in Jesus Jesus himself was the anointed one. And it's Jesus in our lives that brings the anointing. 
and the light of God into our lives. It, it opens up our understanding and it's through Jesus. When we, when we came to Christ and invited Jesus into our lives, what did, what did we receive? Well, the scriptures told us many things, but we, we, we received forgiveness of our sin and we were baptised into the body of Christ. A reference for that is 1 Corinthians 12. 12. And then we were sealed uh, with the Holy Spirit. It was that same Holy Spirit that produced those seven qualities in Jesus that birthed us. And it's those same qualities, to a greater or lesser degree, are in us as we embrace Jesus into our lives. That anointing that was in Jesus, that anointing it flows through us if we reach out to God for it. The light of the menorah, once lit, was never to go out. And so too the light of Christ in us will never go out. As long as we believe and trust in him, as the glory of God came down and filled that tab tabernacle, consecrating it, the menorah and all its utensils, so Jesus was fully consecrated by God. The tabernacle, God's witness among the nation, was also the place of sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. And this ancient tabernacle, with all its rites and sacrifices, was a picture of God's purposes. The more you study the tabernacle, the more you see of God's purposes, this plan of salvation. That study of the, of the tabernacle is so rich in what it brings forth and what it illuminates for us to understand. And it had its fulfilment in Jesus. Had its fulfilment in Jesus on the cross at Calvary for you and I. But that reminded me, you know the story of the Maccabees? Uh, when the Jews were under threat from the Syrian king, the Jews fled into the hills and it was from there that they defeated the Syrian army and then the Maccabees, Maccabees returned to Jerusalem um, and it was, uh, they went there to, to liberate Jerusalem itself. They entered the temple and they cleared it of idols because the Syrian kings had been there and they'd uh, destroyed everything and put their own idols there. But the Maccabees, they, they went and they cleared it. And the man called, uh, the man, uh, uh, the leader of them at that time was a man called Judah. He and his followers built a new altar. And they built a new menorah, which had been dedicated, uh, sorry, which he dedicated. And when they went to light it, they could only find a small pot of oil. Just sufficient to light the menorah for one day. That's all the oil that they could find left. And so they lit the menorah. And by a miracle, which is celebrated today by the Jewish nation, by a miracle it contained enough oil to keep that a menorah alight for eight days. One little pot, which was only sufficient for one day, lasted eight days. This miracle proved to the people of the time that God had again taken his people to himself and taken them under his protection. And that very miracle, it's celebrated every year by the Jewish nation today, celebrated in December, from December 18th through to the 26th. It's the, it's the Feast of Chanukah. So they remember God's provision and the fact that they are under his provision. The light of the menorah was finally extinguished in the temple when the second temple was torn down. Satan had his day. And Satan tried again to extinguish the light of God when Jesus was crucified. I imagine, I'm just thinking, <laughs> Satan's thoughts may be, I think he would think he'd got the victory when he saw Jesus being crucified. Little did he know that that was his undoing because Jesus rose in victory, and we know that victory. And so that the light of that menorah still burns in our hearts and in our lives, within the hearts of all those who believe through the Holy Spirit. 
In Zechariah 4, we read of two olive trees that fed the menorah with oil to keep it burning. And it said that the, it is said that these trees are symbol, symbols, uh, one of Joshua, the high priest, and the other was supposed to be the uh, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, can't say the word Zerubbabel, <laughs> represents the house of uh, King David. So we have the, the spiritual representations of the royal dimensions and the spiritual dimensions held in those two olive trees, the dimensions of the Jewish faith. They are spiritual and they are of the King David, who represents the King of Kings. And Jesus is the fulfilment of that, the fulfilment of that, uh, those olive trees and what they, they meant to the uh, to the Jewish nation at the time. They represented the spiritual and royal dimensions of Jewish faith. Jesus is that fulfilment. He is the spiritual fulfilment. He is the Messiah. He is the great high priest. He's also the royal fulfilment because he is the true king of kings. He's both these roles in one person forever. It didn't end with his death. It will end in eternity. So how do we apply all this? I think we have a certain status in this world. And we have a job to do. We've been uh, delegated certain responsibilities through our relationship with Jesus, the Messiah. In him we have light, a light to shine. We have a light life, lifestyle to live. And the word tells us that we, like a city, you don't hide us, the light of a city on a, on a hill. It's there to be seen. And you don't hide a light under a, a bushel. It's not to be hidden. The light that we carry is not to be hidden not to be suppressed. In Christ, we can destroy the darkness of this world. How? By the, his light shining through us. His shining light will dispel the darkness. And that happens through our relationship with him. How close we are with Jesus. So it's not just a coming to a church on a Sunday and singing a few hymns. That's not relationship. It's coming to Jesus in embracing him personally, knowing him in, your, in our lives, applying his word to our every day. It's dwelling upon the word of God. What is it? The first psalm starts with... Um, oh, now I'm going to forget. Uh, it's meditating on the word of God day, day and night. And in that we'll find Jesus. So in him we have life. We can destroy and dispel the, shy, the darkness because our light will never go out. In him we are priests and I think we should not forget that. We are here to serve before the living God. I believe that as priests we are here as intercessors. We should intercede for our neighbours, our, uh, our ministers, our churches. Uh, our nation we should intercede for those that we know that are in trouble that need help we are the priests we need to be there interceding for those we are a holy priesthood and in, 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 as priests in Christ I believe that we are to experience that sevenfold spirit of God for those who are close to Christ and express uh, the fruit of the spirit in our lives these things should be seen of us. What we are, it should be our character, that sevenfold spirit of, of God, of, of Jesus. We, we are the menorah in these modern times. We are, we are to be light givers in this world. We've been ra raised to high places. We are, we are sat in the heavenlies with Jesus. We are there, we have relationship with him that makes us different. It makes us different to the, the can I say, the worldling, 
the, the, world, the people of this world. We are different. Not that it means we are, it means we're set apart. I don't mean that we are above them. We are, we are simply set apart for his glory and that should be evident through us. We are the menorah, the light givers in this world. We've been raised to those high places in, heaven, in the heavenlies with Jesus. And in him, we are above the principalities and powers that seek to rule this world. Our prayers can restrict the principalities and powers. That's where our battle is. That's what the scriptures teach us, isn't it? So that's where we should be interceding. So our job is figuratively to keep the light, the witness of God, blazing. It's our role to cry out for the Spirit so that his pure oil will keep the church ablaze, so that the world will see his glory. We should do our part. We are his spiritual body here on earth. As Israel was an expression of God's glory, so should the church be today. And we are part of that church. <clears throat> Therefore, in closing, I must ask a couple of questions and I'll leave these with you. First, do, do, do I carry the light of the menorah of God's spiritual temple? Is it in me? Does it dwell in me? The light of the menorah. How well is my light shining? Have I trimmed the wick, my wick, not my neighbours? Have I trimmed my wick in the lamps that I hold? And that's a daily exercise, I believe. We need to come to Jesus every day in our sanctuary. And lastly, am I receiving plenty of oil? The oil of the Holy Spirit. I'll leave those questions with you. And that's another whole sermon, isn't it? <laughs> the answers to those. <laughs> but thank you for listening. I trust that something there in the menorah will stir you and stimulate you to thinking <clears throat> more on the things of the, the tabernacle. It's so rich in uh, what it means in our world today. It's as relevant today as it was in the times of uh, the Israelites. <clears throat>